Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Zephron Olive, and it's time for another Brewer's Minute. So last week, we talked a little bit of looking beyond the curve, and this week's Brewer's Minute is sort of related to that. So I've been playing this blue-green ramp deck lately. If you follow the video series, follow the stream, you've probably seen it. It's really sweet, basically looking to make a ton of mana and then cast things like Ulamog, uh, commit to memories to draw a bunch more cards, part the water veil to pull from tomorrows, all these really big threats. And I've gotten a lot of questions about that deck, and I have to give some credit here to Elian Trazi, who built it. I've been playing it and working on it to some extent as well, but he is the original builder of the deck, but I've gotten a lot of questions about the ramp in the deck, and why not this ramp spell, why not that ramp spell? So I want to take some time this week to talk about the math of ramping, and some things that you have to consider when you're building a ramp deck, and thinking about what ramp spells you put in your deck. So a quick reminder before we break down ramp math, if you enjoy Brewer's Minute and the other series here on the channel, it would be awesome of you if you could take a quick second, click that subscribe button down in the corner of your screen. It's a great way to support the channel and the site for free. So if you look at the blue-green ramp deck, we have essentially four different ramp cards. We have Naga Vitalist and Uvenwald Captive, in the two drop slot. And then in the four drop slot, we have Hedron Archive. And then in the six drop slot, we have Nissa's Renewal. So those are the ramp spells in the deck. And these cards are actually very intentional. So the thing with choosing your ramp spells is you got to really consider what the curve and the goal of your deck is. So if you look at the blue green ramp deck, our plan is to play a two mana ram spell on turn two, which means the next turn we untap, we play our land, that puts us to four mana, which gets us to Hedron Archive. So that means when we untap on turn four, we're going to have six or seven mana, depending on if our two mana ramper lives, also if we make our land drop. Either way, even if we lose our Naga Vitalist or Captive or miss our land drop, we have enough mana for Nissa's Renewal, which in turn is plus three mana, which means the next turn, when we untap, we're going to have the ten mana necessary for Ulamog, ten mana necessary to awaken apart the Water Veil, and immediately attack ten mana to cast a huge pull from tomorrow. So you can see there's a lot of intentionality in the ramp spells in this deck. So one of the cards that I've got questions about from people is Spring to Mind. Spring to Mind is three mana, you get a land out of your deck, basically three mana rampant growth, and then you can aftermath it from the graveyard to draw a couple cards for six mana, and it seems like a natural fit from the deck. It gets you a land, so it's ramping, also drawing cards, two things the deck wants to do, and the problem with Spring to Mine is it just doesn't really line up with the curve of our deck and the math of what we're trying to do. So picture we play Naga Vitalist on turn two, on turn three, we Spring to Mine for plus one mana, so we get another land out of our deck. Our opponent fatal pushes our Naga Vitalist. We untap the next turn. We have five mana. We have nothing to do at five mana. Like, there's literally nothing in the deck. We can pull from tomorrow X3, which is pretty bad. We can play another two drop if we have one. We don't have anything in the five mana slot. So playing a ramp spell that doesn't line up with the curve, and that's what you think of with the ramp deck. Basically, you're counting two things when you're building a ramp deck. You're counting mana and your mana costs, and you're counting turns. Those are the two things that you're counting, and you're adding up what amount of mana do I need, and what spells or ramp spells do I need to play to get to that amount of mana, and what turn can I do that on? So the theory of blue-green ramp is we're going to be going from two mana to four mana to six mana to technically nine mana, but once we make our land drop, 10 mana, which gets us to our big finishers. That is the math, and if we line that up with turns, we're going turn two, two mana, turn three, four mana, turn four, six mana, turn five, 10 mana, and that's our big finisher spot. And we have many cards in that slot that can close out the game. Ulamog does it directly. Part the Water Veil also does it fairly directly. Pull from Tomorrow doesn't just win us the game, but drawing eight
eight cards and getting a whole new hand is likely going to win us the game the next turn. So that's what you're thinking of as you build a ramp deck is the curve and the number of ramp and mana I need to get to these certain points on the curve and how quickly I can do that. And I'm not saying, let me be clear, that going two, four, six, nine, ten is the right way to build a ramp deck, but it's a right way to build a ramp deck if you're playing two mana, four mana, six mana, ten mana spells. Like, that's the right way to build for this curve. If the idea of your deck is to go one mana, three mana, five mana, seven mana into, let's say, Birds of Paradise, into, I don't know, Cultivator's Caravan, into Gilded Lotus, into Karn Liberated... That's a fine curve, too, and that's fine, but you're not going to want to play Naga Vitalis, and you're not going to want to play your Hedron Archives, because they don't line up on the right spot in the curve. You're costing yourself an entire turn, and that's what it's all about when it comes to these decks, is what turn can I get to what mana? What spells do I need to play to make that happen? So as you build a ramp deck, one of the things I see people do, and I think it's a huge mistake, is just be like, eh, this stuff ramps, I'll throw a bunch of ramp in my deck, everything will be cool, and you don't kind of go to the next level and look at the actual cost of your spells and how these ramp spells play out in the course of the game. What does going from 2 mana to 4 mana do for you? What does that mean in an actual game of Magic? What does going from 4 mana to 6 mana do for you? What is the payoff for doing that? What is going from 6 mana to 10 mana do for you? I mean, we wouldn't want to play a 11 mana finisher in this deck. I don't know what that would be in standard, but say there was an 11 mana finisher, we wouldn't want that in this deck because we wouldn't get to it on the right turn. We're costing ourselves a whole nother turn in a turn, especially with a deck like this that is built on expending so many resources to ramp and not necessarily impacting the board directly is a huge deal. One turn is often the difference between winning and losing a game of Magic. Hitting our Ulamog on turn 5 instead of turn 6 is the difference between being dead to Mardu vehicles and beating Mardu vehicles, or whatever uh, deck you're thinking of, zombies, or you name it. So, when you build a ramp deck... Sit down and actually write out the math. Turn two, I have this much mana, which gets me to this much mana on turn three, which means I can play this spell, which makes this much mana, which gets me to this much mana on turn four, which in turn gets me to this much mana the next turn and lets me play this to finish the game. So think through your ramp. Don't just sit down to build your ramp deck and be like, eh, Spring the Mine, or Weaver of Currents, or whatever. That's a card that makes mana, so I want it in my deck, because that's not necessarily true. It really depends on on the deck you're building, and the specific mana costs and turns that you're looking to get to with the stuff in your deck. So I think there's a default that people have when building ramp decks, and decks in general, where you default to playing the most powerful option with no concern of what's in your deck. You look at power in a vacuum rather than power within the context of what your deck's trying to do. So next time you build a ramp deck, take a minute to think through the numbers, think through the turn cycles, and the end result is you're going to have a much better, much more functional, much more consistent deck than if you just play what appears in a vacuum to be the most powerful ramp spells at random points on the curve. So anyway, that's my rant about ramp math. Hopefully it was helpful. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video! If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.